Hi everybody, this is Willem. Say hi, Willem. He doesn't seem to be having a great day, does he? Dare I say, nor would you be if these guys were throwing you out a window. This is not some cheeky frat prank either. Outside this window is a 70 foot drop. These guys are assuming Willem will not be walking away from this experience. Why are they doing this? What did Willem do to make them so mad? Are they going to get away with it? Is anyone in charge here? How did this Willem fellow getting thrown from a window lead to the modern system of nation states and geopolitical diplomacy under which the world still operates 500 years later? You probably don't know, but you're about to. Welcome to Cause and Effect. Do we all know what Catholics and Protestants are? Can we safely skip all that? You know what? We are going to address it just briefly. I don't know who you are watching this video. You might be Dr. Cambridge McCarver IV, and you know all this stuff better than I do, and you're just watching this video to check my facts, which, if that's the case, I'll see you in the comment section. Or maybe you're a space alien on your first visit to planet Earth, and you're just looking to do some basic research before you make landfall. But I'll split the difference between you two. Before we get back to Willem and Willem's Great Fall, we will briefly explain the whole Catholic-Protestant thing. So as far back as I can remember, at the very beginning, way back in early Christianity, there were all kinds of diverse sects and different groups, all kind of thinking about Christ and worshiping Christ in their own way. But from the early 300s, really until the very early 1500s, the only way to be Christian was to be a Catholic, for the most part. As powerful political institutions are sometimes known to do, a fair bit of corruption and mission perversion crept into the church's behavior. Selling salvation to the highest bidder seems rather unchristlike in the eyes of some, perhaps justifiably, certainly in the eyes of German priest Martin Luther, who published his 95 Theses in 1517, arguing specifically against the practice of selling salvation in the form of the indulgence certificates. Now, of course, the the Reformation was fantastically complex, and reducing it simply to the figure of Luther is a dramatic oversimplification, but we can connect him accurately with the genesis of the Reformation. As the 1500s roll on, we find at last an alternative pathway to Christ. Protestantism. The Catholics respond to the Protestant Reformation with an event that has come to be known as the Catholic Counter-Reformation. Around the middle of the century, a reform movement resurgence of Catholic fervor in direct response to those Protestants who had strayed from the flock. Now, I don't want to undersell this. Besides the concurrent age of exploration, this tension is the story of Europe of the past 500 years. The events of the two world wars and the very shape of the world we live in today largely stem from this religious tension and, of course, the concurrent age of exploration and resulting conflict vis-a-vis -vis overseas colonial holdings. All right, y'all, there is your mise en scene. Scene. Let's get back to Villain. Look at him. He waited for us. Still frozen in time, halfway out that window. Appreciate it, buddy. The time is the year 1618, the place is the city of Prague. In 2023, Prague is the capital of the Czech Republic, considered one of the most beautiful and culturally significant cities in the world. In 1618, it was the capital of the Kingdom of Bohemia, which was itself a constituent state within the Holy Roman Empire, ruled by the famous House of Habsburg. You know, that one that ruled a good part of Europe for an astonishing 700 years. It's pretty incredible when the first monarch in your family looks like this and the last one looks like this. Kind of reminds me of those Tom Brady and Kobe Bryant first and last video game depictions, except, you know, multiplied by 35. And Prague is right in the thick of all this religious strife. In the 1550s, there was an agreement among the princes called the Peace of Augsburg, which states the principle that a prince's subjects ought to be the same religion as that prince himself. The Habsburgs are Catholics, but they don't enforce the Peace of Augsburg on the people of Bohemia. In fact, they go to great pains to protect the religious rights of Protestant Bohemians. From Matthias's predecessor, they receive a so-called letter of majesty, granting them the right to freely practice their religion, in contradiction of the protocol set out in the Peace of Augsburg 60 years earlier. But when Emperor Matthias makes his cousin Ferdinand of Styria the king of Bohemia in 1617, everything changes. Ferdinand is a fire breather, a Catholic to the core, and he wants no part of freedom for the Protestants. He does not respect the letter of majesty. The year after he becomes king, he forces Emperor Matthias to stop construction of Protestant chapels in Bohemia. When the Bohemian assembly gripes about this, Ferdinand says, well, your assembly doesn't exist anymore. How do like them apples. The Bohemians take this badly. 
The scene is 23rd May, 1618, Prague Castle. Four Catholic lords, Jaroslav Barita, Willem Slavata, Adam von Sternberg, and Matthew Lobkowitz arrive at the castle at 8.30 in the morning. The Protestants are waiting for them in the chancellery on the top floor. They are led by the Protestant Count Jindrik Matthias, the Count of Thurn, and he is pissed. He was the governor of Karlstein Castle, but the emperor removed him, all behind this religious disagreement. Matthias is here to kick ass and chew bubblegum, and bubblegum has not been invented yet. The Catholics come before an assembly of angry Protestants. This assembly legally does not exist anymore. They are not in a mood to care. The Protestant lords charge the four assembled Catholic lords with having received a letter from Emperor Matthias calling for their execution. They also have a copy of the letter, so there is no point in denying it. And finally, Jindrik Matthias and the Protestants drop the bomb. The reason they are all there. They want to know if the four Catholics present signed off on this order of execution. Two of the lords, von Sternberg and Lobkowitz, are acquitted immediately. The Protestants declare them as being too pious to have taken any part. For his part, on his way out of the chancellery, von Sternberg assures them that in spite of his fervent Catholicism, he would never take part in any action that contravened the Letter of Majesty. This leaves Willem Slavata and Jaroslav Barita, both fire-breathing Catholic hardliners like Ferdinand, and this is well known to every Protestant in attendance. Barita, in fact, replaced Jindrik Matthias as the governor of Karlstein Castle. This is perhaps not a coincidence that he is still in the room. Standing in a meeting hall full of enraged Protestants, the two lords are as alone as the Christians being fed to the lions in Roman times. And we can imagine that this exact image likely crossed their minds. It's just them and their secretary, Philip Fabricius, against seemingly an ocean of their enemies. And incredibly, they own up to it. Not only do they acknowledge endorsing the letter's intent, they acknowledge that they themselves were responsible for convincing the emperor to sign off on its intent. Not only do they endorse it, in other words, they admit responsibility for its contents. They state that they welcome any punishment the Protestants have in mind. It is believed that the two lords thought they would be simply arrested and perhaps ransomed back to their own houses. If that is indeed the case, they catastrophically underestimated the anger of the Protestants in attendance. They have wildly misapprehended the seriousness of the situation. Jindrik Matthias would not give them long to reconsider their mistake. The Count of Thurn directly accuses the two remaining lords of trying to deprive the Bohemian Protestants of the protections afforded by the Letter of Majesty. You are enemies of us and of our religion, have desired to deprive us of our Letter of Majesty, have horribly plagued your Protestant subjects, and have tried to force them to adopt your religion against their wills or have had them expelled for this reason. He then turns to the crowd and essentially says that if they are to keep the Letter of Majesty, the two lords standing before them must lose their lives. Were we to keep these men alive, then we would lose the letter of majesty and our religion. For there can be no justice to be gained from or by them. Barita prays as he is dragged across the room to the awaiting open window. He is thrown from the window with his cloak, his sword and dagger, but not his hat. Slavata tries to fight, clinging to the window ledge like his life depends on it, because it does. The men beat his right hand to a pulp and his body fails before his spirit. He is thrown from the window with his coat and sword, but again, no hat. The lack of hats is significant. This is to add to the humiliation of the affair. The secretary, Philip Fabricius, follows them soon after. By the year 1618, the act of defenestration was a reasonably common means in Prague of expressing the community's displeasure with an individual. It was an act of mob violence, a raising of the hue and cry against a community member who, in the eyes of the angry mob, had committed the most grievous of sins. In the century before the Reformation, there were in fact two other extremely famous and notable incidents of execution by defenestration in Prague. In 1419, a Hussite priest at the Church of the Virgin Mary of the Snows led his congregation in a march on town square, where they defenestrated a judge, a chief magistrate, and several members of the town council. All were killed in the fall. When the King of Bohemia heard the news of this defenestration, he reportedly died of shock. In 1483, the people tossed a chief magistrate and seven town council members from the windows of the councils of Old and Newtown. The magistrate died in the fall. The town council members were already dead before they were thrown from the windows. Here is the window from which Yaroslav Barita, Willem Slavata, and Philip Fabricius were thrown. Doesn't really look that impressive from a distance, I suppose. Wait, that's a bench right there just below the window. Uh, we can assume that's probably basically standard size. Boy, that actually does kind of look pretty far, doesn't it? Here, let's look at another angle. Oh good, a person. Wow, that context kind of makes it look a little more imposing, doesn't it? Here, you know what? Let's grab that guy. Sorry, guy, but we're grabbing you. And we're going to count how many guys it takes to get to the ground in a straight line. Well, hell, when you put it that way, that's a lot of guys. 
That's, that's a pretty long fall. So that does seem kind of imposing when we look at it that way. That picture of the building, even with the guy walking by, maybe doesn't even really do it justice though. To my surprise, Google actually has some information to yield as to how likely one is to survive a fall from 70 feet. Well, not exactly that, but we have from this website offgridweb.com, which I know absolutely nothing about, but I assume they've done their research. A person has a 50% chance of dying in a 48 foot fall and a 90% chance of dying in an 84 foot fall. I'm not gonna show the math here. I don't really feel like doing it, but those two points on the spectrum suggest to me that four out of five times you fall from 70 feet, it will probably kill you. And that's by modern standards. I think we can safely assume the mortality rate was rather higher for such an event in the early 1600s, so we can probably bump that up. Let's call it nine out of 10. After all, recall those earlier defenestrations. Everyone involved in those ones died, and it's safe to assume that general health or medical care didn't really improve that much from the 1400s to the 1600s. Philip Fabricius, Yaroslav Barita, and Willem Slavata all survived the 70-foot fall. Sources disagree as to why the three men survived. The Catholics believed that it was due to the intercession of the Virgin Mary and the angels. The Protestants at the time would claim that the three men landed in a dung heap, and again, optics are relevant here. Much more likely, it's because the wall was slightly sloped, allowing the three men to tumble down to the ground rather than simply fall through the air. Probably being thrown out with their cloaks was a huge contributing factor, softening the blows as they fell. When they realize that Slovata, Fabricius, and Barita are still alive in the ditch at the bottom of the wall, the Protestants fire their guns at the windows at them, hitting absolutely nothing. The three men must have been certain then of their protection from the Almighty, though Slovata at least is badly injured. In spite of this assuredly horrifying experience, things end well for all three of our plucky heroes. Willem Slovata is arrested initially, but he escapes about a year later, and while he is briefly forced into retirement by political events, he bounces back. Ten years after being chucked out of a window in Bohemia, he is appointed High Chancellor of Bohemia. Yaroslav Barita lived another 30 years after the defenestration, and he was appointed the Supreme Burgrave of Bohemia in 1638. Philip Fabricius was a humble secretary before the Protestants hurled him out a seven-story high window, but after surviving that event, the emperor made him a noble. And he gave him the title Baron von Hohenfell, which translates literally to Baron of High Fall. That's not a joke, it's not made up, it's not something that George R. R. Martin came up with. That's really what happened. Don't blame me. The exact chain of events that follow the defenestration are like watching a train wreck in slow motion. It's inevitable and you are powerless to stop it. The defenestration is the first shot in what everyone knows is about to be a war, and the Catholics and the Protestants on both sides start preparing for the battle that everyone knows is coming. The Bohemians depose Ferdinand as King of Bohemia and install a Protestant ally, Frederick V. But they have committed a critical mistake in doing so. They deposed a rightful king. So as both Catholics and Protestants are going door to door throughout Europe selling their Girl Scout cookies, that is to say, begging for allies in the conflict that everyone knows is coming, the Protestants have handicapped themselves out of the gate. Nobody wants to be seen as supporting a usurper. Eight November, 1620, two years after the defenestrations of the Catholics. White Mountain, very near to Prague and the scene of the defenestrations. The forces that meet on the field are officially under the banners of the Holy Roman Empire and the Bohemian Confederation, but we can also read this as Catholicism versus Protestantism. The Protestants are 30,000 and the Catholics are only 25,000, but don't let that number deceive you. The 30,000 are predominantly rebels and the 25,000 are largely veterans, led by two men who typify capable military leadership. Johann Serkles, the Count of Tilly, and Albrecht von Waldstein. Tilly and von Waldstein easily take Western Bohemia and immediately move on Prague. The Protestant commander, Christian of Anhalt, sets up defensive positions that Tilly and von Waldstein simply go around. In a last ditch effort, Anhalt sets up on White Mountain and prepares for the fight. The battle lasts one hour. The Protestants are crushed. This is the opening battle in what came to be known as the Thirty Years' War. Look, I'm not going to mince words or beat around the bush with you all. This war is a nightmare. It is a three decade long Gen X to Gen Z, Detroit Lions, Cleveland Browns, relevancy drought long nightmare. Try to imagine that you're born the year this kicked off. If you're over 30, imagine the first 30 years of your life, age zero to 30. Europe is hell. Life is hell. People at the time refer to a frenzy of despair at the collapse of their social order. Peasants are in danger from plundering soldiers on either side. Wolves, rodents, and wild boar overrun crops and farms. Many seek a supernatural cause to the horrors, and hundreds from all walks of life are executed in a series of witch hunts and witch trials. In large part due to this war, the horrors of the 17th century are unrivaled until the 20th. 
From 1618 to 1635, it is a civil war within the Holy Roman Empire, and after that it is a European war until 1648. Five to eight million dead, and as always with these things, the outbreaks of famine and disease are heinously worse than the death toll from battle. Europe's population declines by as much as a third, though many communities by half or more. In this Swedish village, which I will not try to pronounce, 230 fighting men were conscripted, 225 were killed, and five came back permanently disabled. Some communities exaggerate their casualties to avoid taxes. Paradoxically, gruesomely, living standards for the survivors actually improve in many places, as occurred in the wake of the bubonic plague. But regardless, population levels in Europe would not recover until the middle of the next century. The horrors of the war bring about a renaissance of continental literature. For Germans of later generations, it is remembered as a moment of national trauma, inspiring both the drive to unify Germany in the 19th century, and also inspiring the architects of the Third Reich in the 20th. And finally, in 1648, it's over. The belligerents on both sides negotiate a pair of peace treaties in two different cities because they both wanted to control the territory on which the treaty was negotiated. These two agreements have come down to us in history as the Peace of Westphalia. Now bear with me, as this is a bit of a weird mental leap from our modern perspective. When we in the modern world say nation and country and state, we mean essentially the same thing. That is to say, the nation state. For us here in the modern world, the only international political system we've ever known, the nation is the country is the state. We are subject to the laws of our own local overarching political entity with its relatively firm, concretely defined borders. Prior to the 17th century, this was just not the case. Almost anywhere you lived, you were subject to overlapping, often conflicting allegiances and loyalties to a variety of secular or religious powers. A powerful rich guy could raise a private army and go attack another powerful rich guy. The borders of their lands aren't necessarily firmly defined in a legal sense. Now, post-Westphalia and the changing attitude towards sovereignty, not only are those borders basically firm, but the Westphalian peace also strengthens the principle of non-interference with the domestic affairs of another state authority. A principle so enduring that it is still part of the United Nations Charter today. Again, this was not a prevalent governing idea prior to the Westphalian peace. Above all, the consequence of Westphalia is the primacy of the state. The state the state makes war, the state sets laws for the people within its borders, and states are not supposed to interfere in the affairs of other states, again as a general rule. Now, I don't want to mislead you all into thinking that this was a sudden, bright line, cataclysmic change. Oh, before the Peace of Westphalia, we had this medieval system, and after 1648, we abruptly had this well-developed, perfectly modern system, and there wasn't something of a gradual change. Of course, that's not what I'm saying. Of course, the change was somewhat gradual over time. I also don't want you to think that the Peace of Westphalia's effect on the development of modern states hasn't been challenged by scholars because it has. Is the causal relationship suggested in this video wildly oversimplified and challenged by hundreds of scholarly papers out there? Sure. That's what historians do. If you'd like to read up on that academic scholarly debate, the articles are all over the internet for the low, low price of $51 each. There you go, Professor Cambridge McHarvard IV. I've hedged my bets. Feel free to write your YouTube comments anyway, though. But I stand by the overall thesis. Willem Slavata and his pals getting tossed out a window in 1618 led to greater unrest and gathering conflict in Bohemia, leading to the Thirty Years' War, leading to the Peace of Westphalia, leading to the modern system of nation-states under which we still live today. You never know what little butterfly effect event is going to cause a great paradigm shift transition leading to the next system. That event could be happening right this moment. Maybe it's you watching this video. Probably not, but you just never know. Alright y'all, that's it. That's the video. Thanks for the click. Be good, kiddos. Out.